Hi, and welcome to the five pillars of crypto. In this free class, you're going to learn a little bit about blockchains, NFTs, GameFi, Metaverse, and DeFi. By the time you finish this course, you'll know exactly what to expect in the crypto bootcamp. First, we have blockchains. So what are blockchains exactly? A blockchain is just a ledger that keeps track of transactions. We use ledgers for accounting to keep track of our income and expenses. But unlike accounting ledgers, blockchains are distributed ledgers, right? So that means that it's similar to Google Sheets or a Excel file that multiple people are working on at the same time. A blockchain is made out of multiple blocks that are chained together, hence blockchain. The transactions get recorded onto a single block and that block, when it becomes full, gets added to the blockchain. So a block is just a container for transaction data. Just like blockchains are made out of individual blocks, the Excel file is made out of individual cells, right? So there's a lot of similarities here where you have a cell in an Excel file, right? The cell just contains data. And then if you add a bunch of cells together that has a bunch of data in it, you have an entire Excel file. It's the same way with blockchains. So all your transactions from the blockchain go onto a single block. And when that block becomes full, it becomes part of the blockchain. But if we're storing financial data on the blockchain, how do we make sure that it's not easily destroyed? To understand how blockchains are durable, we have to first talk about how we store data today. So this is Amazon's data center. Right? It's 12 million square feet, and it can power tens of thousands of computers. These computers are used by companies like Disney, Netflix, Airbnb, and even NASA to host their data on the internet. So inside of this data center are hundreds of server racks. These are just cabinets that hold the computers and keep things tidy. Inside of those server racks, are individual servers. Now, these servers are not like the kind of computers that you have at home. These are very flat and they are designed to fit inside of server racks. But what would happen if someone were to attack this data center, right? What if they just bombed the entire center with all these thousands of computers inside of it? Well, if that happened, all the servers inside would die. Right. That means that the services like Netflix, Disney and anyone else that uses these servers would also go offline. This is super risky, right, because it creates a central point of failure. Instead of storing all the data in a data center, blockchains store all of their data on thousands of computers around the world. Each one of these servers contain the entire history of the blockchain. So there's redundancy on every single computer. All of them have the same copy of the blockchain on them. And these servers are also known as nodes. So these are nodes and anybody is able to create a node, which is basically just a de dedicated computer that is running some software on it that you know supports the blockchain. Setting up a node is a technical process, but if you're able to set one up and connect it to the blockchain, then you can earn mining rewards like Bitcoin, right? So anyone's able to create these nodes and join the network permissionlessly. This means that you don't need to ask for approval to join or leave the network. And the network rewards people with cryptocurrency for joining and helping secure the network. So the more nodes that join, let's say, the Bitcoin network, the more secure it becomes. And you'll see why that is in a second. Even if a hacker attacks the network and gains access to some of the nodes, you're still fine, right? Because the, no the other nodes have a full copy of the blockchain and the network keeps running just like normal. But if the hacker gains control of 51% of the nodes, then we have a problem. Then the hacker can gain control of the entire blockchain. And that means they own all of the crypto on that chain. But this is highly, highly unlikely 
because the nodes are distributed across the world and there's no single point of failure. And because it's permissionless, anyone can join, right? Like, so if th this hacker is able to grab hold of, you know, three out of the five nodes that are here, there's anyone else that's able to spin up new nodes, join this, and now they don't own 51% of the network anymore. But, you know, it's never going to be like five nodes that run a blockchain. It's thousands. So it's extremely hard to hack more than 51% of the network. Next, we have NFTs. What are NFTs? NFT stands for non-fungible token. Okay, but what does that mean? Well, we have to talk about fungibility in order to understand what non-fungible means. So fungibility is a property of goods whose units are interchangeable, right? So cash is a good example of fungibility because $100 is worth the same as $250 or $520 or $101 bills, right? Each of these are interchangeable, which means they are fungible. But the Mona Lisa is not fungible. Even an identical copy of it is not worth the same as the original. That's why provenance is so important in the art world. Provenance is a record of ownership going all the way back to the artist so that you can prove that the artwork that you have is from the original artist. And because NFTs are on the blockchain, you can trace the chain of ownership all the way back to the original artist so NFTs have provenance built right in. But on the internet, everything is digital, right? That means that it's super easy to just right click and save a file with just a few clicks of a button. You can copyright your work, but that requires extensive paperwork and fees, right? And you're not gonna copyright every single thing that you put on the internet. And even if you did, you still have to rely on third parties to enforce your copyright claims. So the entire process is really tedious and not really built for the internet. But NFTs enable us to prove ownership of a digital item without having to rely on third parties. Ownership is easily trackable on the blockchain and this prevents people from being able to copy your work and pass it off as the original. So this is a technology that is specifically uh, like built for the internet. And let's see how that works. NFTs are like housing deeds. Your ownership of a house is represented by a deed, right? Every house has a deed that's associated to its ownership. And that's how you would buy or sell a house. And just the same way that a housing deed represents a house, a NFT represents ownership over a digital file. And this could be any type of file. It doesn't have to be just artwork. It doesn't have to be a picture. It could be music, like an MP3 file, or it could be a video file. Any kind of digital file can be turned into an NFT. And just like a housing deed stores information about the house, an NFT stores the same kind of information about the digital file. So it saves the name of the buyer, the seller, the address, Right, so like if you have a house, it will have the address of the house on there. The, in this case, the NFT has the location of the file. So it's like a web address of the file that it's referring to. And it also has the signature of all the parties involved. Then that NFT gets stored onto the blockchain. And anyone can inspect the blockchain to see who currently owns an NFT and they can even trace the ownership all the way back to the creator. Next, we have GameFi. So what is GameFi? GameFi is the combination of gaming and finance. So the problem with gaming companies today is that they make money by selling you in-game items in exchange for real-life currency. And they design this entire purchasing experience in a casino-like way to encourage more spending from users. Even after they sell you in-game items, you don't technically own them. Buying in-game items just gives you access to use them for your account. In other words, you don't own those assets because you can't sell them to other people. Everything in the game has zero value outside of the game, including the currency. And many companies don't even allow you to sell your account. 
If you try to profit off of their game in any way, they will just outright ban your account. So how do blockchains solve this problem, right? Blockchain games have several advantages over the status quo. In blockchain games, their in-game currency is actually a cryptocurrency, which means that you can take the in-game currency and bring it over to a centralized exchange or any exchange that you want and convert it into real dollars, right? You can convert the in-game currency to Ethereum and then from there you can, you know, cash out into real dollars or Bitcoin and cash out to real dollars. But there's a path for you to take the in-game currency, bring it to an exchange and cash out into real life dollars. Another thing blockchain games do is that they incorporate NFTs directly into their design, right? So this means that the items that you get in the game are minted as NFTs, which means that you actually own those items. And then you can take those items off of the game onto a secondary marketplace and you can sell them or trade them for different things. And that's how blockchains and NFTs tie into gaming. So you can see how the previous two lessons are being used to show you how GameFi works. Next, let's move on to the metaverse. What is the metaverse? The metaverse is a virtual world where users can work, play, and socialize. It's the internet reimagined as a virtual world. So imagine that you're shopping on Amazon, as you do today, you're looking through a web browser, right? And there's just different things that you see on your web browser and you're just trying to click on each one and browse through the reviews and stuff like that. It's all 2D, right? But if you were doing this in the metaverse, then the Amazon store would look like a virtual store in a mall, right? Like it's, it's the same as if you were going through the mall and you were exploring the shelves and looking through every item and looking at it from different angles and stuff like that. That's how the metaverse will incorporate real life items into it. There's one company that went all in on the metaverse, so much so that they even changed their name to Meta. So Meta used to be Facebook. Right, but they just rebranded to now being called Meta. They own Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp. And they're spending $10 billion per year developing their own metaverse. But it's important to note that this metaverse is going to be a centralized metaverse. In the future, we will have both centralized and decentralized metaverses. The metaverse should not be confused with virtual reality. VR is just a technological platform, just like the smartphone or a laptop. A metaverse is a virtual world. You'll be able to access this world in many ways, whether it's smartphones, laptops, tablets, or desktops. Some will support virtual reality. For those virtual reality metaverses, you will need to have a virtual reality headset. And this is why Meta is going so hard on this, because they want to own a technological platform, right? They don't want to be dependent on Apple or Google to provide the platform that they run on. So that's why they bought Oculus and that's why they're doing a fully VR metaverse. So what would a centralized metaverse look like? In a centralized metaverse, like Meta's Horizon Worlds, the entire virtual world is going to be stored on centralized servers that are 100% owned by Meta, right? And this company, Meta, is owned by Mark Zuckerberg. So he owns 57% of the voting shares of Meta. So he basically gets to decide what happens with his company. Even if every single investor in his company decided to vote no, he could still override that because he owns 57% of the voting shares. So this effectively makes him the emperor of this metaverse. And on top of that, anytime players sell items to each other in the game, they will have to pay a commission to the company Meta, right? Because this company is spending $10 billion a year. They have to make that money back somehow. So one of the things they're proposing is to put a tax on every time someone trades items with each other. And that fee can be as high as 50%. So what's a decentralized metaverse look like? 
In a decentralized metaverse, the ownership of all the items in the game are determined by NFTs, right? So if you buy land in a decentralized metaverse, there's a deed to, of ownership to that, right? It's represented by the NFT. Or if you have items that are like, let's say you have um, the latest uh, virtual Yeezy sneakers, right? And you want to show off and all of that stuff on, on this decentralized metaverse, those will also be minted as NFTs. And those NFTs get stored on the blockchain, right? And the NFTs are owned by people. So if you have a metaverse that is, um, you know, let's say you go into some secret room and you have to have a specific item to access this room, right? How, what, like, how does that work exactly? So if you go into this room and it says you need the latest Yeezy sneakers, uh, you have to be wearing them uh, on your avatar to get in the room. The metaverse will basically ping the blockchain and check to see if your character is wearing the, the NFT sneakers that is the key to let you in the room. And if you are, then you can get in. And if you're not the owner of the NFT, or if you don't have one of the sneakers, then you can't get in. And that's how the decentralized metaverse will work. So there's no centralized company that's trying to profit off of you in a decentralized metaverse, which is why decentralized metaverses will be orders of magnitude bigger than the centralized versions. And in a decentralized metaverse, players are free to sell their items to each other on any secondary marketplace, right? So you'll have one, let's say you have one big decentralized metaverse, right? And it's the most popular one. Everyone's on it. It's kind of like, imagine it's like the Facebook of the future, right? So it has like 3 billion users. Everybody's on it. And the difference is you'll have one single metaverse, but then you'll have multiple different marketplaces. So the difference, the, it's a slight difference, but it's an important one. So each marketplace will have its own commission that it will impose on those transactions, right? And this is usually 2.5%. And this keeps the marketplace from price gouging its customers. So for example, if a popular marketplace decides to increase their commissions on each trade to 10%, people will just leave and go to a different marketplace, right? Because you can take your items with you wherever you want because they're NFTs. And any Web3 website can plug into this database, which is open and anyone can use it. So you can build other marketplaces off of the same database and basically steal the customers from the most popular marketplace because they're deciding to charge 10% commission. You can charge 2.5% and then everyone will start using the new platform instead of the old one, right? So, and if anybody wants to, uh, gain even more customers, they can lower their commissions to 2%. And this is pretty much a competition to the, to the bottom, right? So this keeps all of the marketplaces competing with each other so that we win in the end. And finally, we have decentralized finance. So what is DeFi? DeFi stands for decentralized finance, and it uses blockchain technology and smart contracts to replace the banks. So in 2009, we have the Bitcoin white paper, right? And for a while, it was only enthusiasts and cryptographers that were interested in Bitcoin. But in 2015, you have Ethereum, right? And with Ethereum, we got a whole new suite of technologies like smart contracts. So the evolution of smart contracts and Ethereum and all the other uh, technological innovations from 2015 to 2020, there was a huge chain of new innovations that happened. And finally, in 2020, crypto becomes a cash flowing asset. And that started off DeFi summer. So to understand DeFi, let's look at how centralized to traditional finance works, right? So let's say you're a you know, regular person, you're, you wanna save some money. So you put your money into the bank 
and the bank says, oh, no problem. We'll keep your money safe. Here's 0.01% interest for opening a savings account with us, right? So the bank knows that this is a savings account, not a checking account. So it's not likely that you'll be withdrawing from this anytime soon. So what they do is they loan out most of that money to someone that wants to borrow it for a mortgage or an auto loan or whatever they need the, the money for. So the bank loans out your money and then the person who's borrowing the money gets charged 4% interest, right? And then the bank pockets the 3.99% interest and they give you 0.01%. This is called fractional reserve banking, right? And it's also one of the reasons why um, when you have bank runs, which is when there's mass panic in the market and everybody goes to withdraw all of their money from their savings account, the banks can't fulfill all of that because they don't have that much money in the banking system, right? They don't have that much money in their vaults to the point where everyone can withdraw all of their money. So this is the way that our current system is set up and the banks profit off of it. And there's no option for us to be able to directly lend our money to somebody that wants to borrow it without knowing them in person or you know, having some sort of trust with that person. But in decentralized finance, you only have the two parties involved and a smart contract in the middle. So you have the lender and the borrower and a smart contract. A smart contract just executes transactions with pre-programmed code. It's kind of like a vending machine, right? So with a vending machine, you just put your dollar in, you make a selection, you get what you selected, it, it works the same way with a smart contract, but there's just, you know, m much more layers of complexity to it. But fundamentally, they're kind of like a vending machine. So if you want to take out a loan for $10,000, all you have to do is deposit $20,000 worth of Bitcoin. And we'll get into why someone would even do that in, in a second. The code is also fully open source. Right? So anyone's able to look at it to see exactly what the smart contract will do. So the first step is a lender will deposit stable coins into the smart contract. A stable coin is a non-volatile cryptocurrency that's pegged to the dollar. So one stable coin equals one dollar. A borrower that wants to take out a loan will usually deposit some collateral. Right? It's usually in the form of Bitcoin or Ether and they'll receive stable coins. They can do whatever they want with this stable coin, but they have to be very careful because they can lose their collateral if they're not paying attention. So let's say a borrower deposits $20,000 worth of Bitcoin and takes out a loan for $10,000. They need the $10,000 right away for some emergency bill that came up or whatever the need is, right? It's a short, short term loan. Uh, they know that they're able to pay it back, but they just need some time. So they would take that $10,000, do whatever they want with it, but they didn't want, they did not want to sell off their Bitcoin just yet. They want to hold on to Bitcoin for a long, long time. So this is one way to be able to deploy that capital without having to um, actually sell it. But the problem is, if the price of Bitcoin drops and the collateral that they deposited is now worth $12,000 instead of 20,000, this smart contract is programmed to automatically sell this off to protect the lender's deposit, right? They don't want lenders to lose money. So it will just automatically sell off your collateral and the only way to avoid that is to either deposit more collateral if you want to keep your loan open or you pay back what you borrowed so that you can close out the loan. So after a borrower closes out their loan, they, you know, they repay the loan plus the interest and the smart contracts give them their collateral back. And then for the lender, they get their interest. So in this scenario, the smart contract and the platform that's providing this service here 
will take a small fee from the interest payments. So you get to loan out your crypto or your stable coins and earn up to 3% to 5% in passive income. The smart contract does all the work for you, right? So borrowers are coming, they're depositing collateral, they're getting their loans, they're paying back their loans, they're paying interest on their loans. And if they don't pay back their loans, their collateral gets sold. So you're safe either way. And you just get to collect interest on it. And instead of the smart contract taking 3.99% like the banks do, they'll take 0.25%, right? And they'll pass off the rest of the interest to you. And that's how smart contracts are able to help us be able to loan our crypto to other people. And it's fully automated. All right, so let's review what we just learned. We have blockchains, which are distributed ledgers that keep track of our transactions. They're made up of individual blocks that get chained together. Then we have NFTs. And NFTs are just like housing deeds. So just like a housing deed represents ownership of a house, an NFT represents ownership of a digital file. And then that NFT gets stored on the blockchain. GameFi is the fusion of gaming and finance. Instead of a gaming company owning 100% of the game and all the assets in the game, blockchain games mint their items as NFTs, and players are the ones that own these NFTs, not the gaming company. The metaverse is a virtual world where users can work, play, or even socialize. This is the internet reimagined as a virtual world. And finally, we have decentralized finance. This is an entirely new industry that's being built on top of blockchains and cryptocurrency. It uses smart contracts so that we can lend our crypto out to strangers without having to worry that they will run away with our money. This is also how you can earn passive income from your savings instead of relying on a bank to give you 0.01% for a savings account. And that concludes our free class. If you enjoyed what you saw today, then I highly recommend you check out the full course where we go into much more detail into each one of these sections. By the end of the full bootcamp course, you'll have an in-depth understanding of the entire crypto landscape, and you can leverage that knowledge to invest in the companies that will be the ones that finally replace Google, Amazon, Facebook, and all of the tech giants that exist today. Because the way that we have our entire industry structured the incentives lie with the companies, right? They're always trying to generate as much profits as possible, and you're the one that has to pay the price for it. With decentralized systems, the incentives are completely different. The incentives align so that the marketplaces have to compete with each other, and we're the beneficiaries of that. And that's it for now. I'll see you guys in the course.